kick off. Welcome to the Oracle Analytics Summit Series. My name is Duncan Fitter, Director of Product Strategy for Oracle Analytics in the Product Management Team here in Oracle. I'm very pleased to welcome Andy Mason from the NHS BSA to talk to us today. Um, if you have any questions, please do submit them through the Q&A uh, panel at the bottom of your screen. And certainly if time permits, Andy will be happy to address them uh, at the end of the session. So over to you, Andy. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Duncan, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, joining me this morning or afternoon, depending on, on where you are. I'm just going to go through a bit of our journey into analytics at the NHS BSA and, and then go on to some of the, the great outcomes and use cases of, of our data analytics journey. Um, but first of all, who am I? I'm Andrew Mason, the Data Warehouse and BI Manager at the NHS BSA. But I've got about 15 years of experience in both data warehousing and business intelligence in both the public and private sector. And I've been at the NHS BSA for just over three years, probably creeping towards four years now. Um, I'd like to apologize to anybody that has uh, turned up to see this fine gentleman you can see on the screen here. My um, nine week lockdown has encouraged me to grow some facial hair or at least attempt to. So I'm looking a bit more like this these days, but that's enough about me. So who are the NHS BSA? Well, we are an arm's length body of the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, I like to call us more of a, a dog's body because we do a lot of the ugly jobs, a lot of the grunt work of the NHS. We're experts at managing healthcare information and services at scale. We manage about a quarter of the NHS budget and our purpose is to be a catalyst for better health throughout the NHS and um, we are using data and, and analytics to, to help us achieve that. So these are some of our operational services which are fundamental to us achieving our vision of being the delivery partner of choice within the NHS. Many of them are high volume transactional services, many have been or are being digitized and all of them result in just an absolute wealth of data that we can start to harness and use for the greater good. Here are some performance stats just to give a bit of scale to the NHS BSA. So we process and reimburse pharmacists on over 1 billion prescription items a year and 43 million dental activity forms every year. About 36 billion go through our books every year. Um, we've got over a million NHS employers on our electronic staff record, over 3 million on the pension scheme and 11 million registered candidates on NHS jobs. So <clears throat> the NHS BSA has a great reputation and has become the partner of choice for taking on these high volume transaction processes such as making payments to pharmacists or um, processing exemption certificates and things like that. This is our bread and butter. We're taking on more and more of these services and refining the ones we currently operate and digitizing them in the process. But in early 2014, the challenge was laid down. Could the NHS BSA deliver 1 billion of annual recurring savings by March 2018? And it was this really that kickstarted our data analytics and insight area of the NHS BSA. So we set up a data science team known as the DAL who quickly identified a hundred million pounds worth of savings in the first six months. That got us the buy-in we needed to carry on our, on our analytics journey. So we started building an enterprise data warehouse and business intelligence system, started producing clinical dashboards. By 2019, um, the NHS BSA had reached the target of identifying savings of, of a billion pounds and data analytics supported that to the tune of just over 800 million. But we didn't stop there. We, we continue to push ourselves in the data and analytics arena. So we are using some of our data to look at try and tackle some of the workforce issues within the NHS. We have been supporting a number of COVID-19 work streams. We are producing 
official statistics now, national statistics, and we're supporting the NHS in the population health. So these are our family members that we work with closely and share our data sets with, as well as building BI or analytic products and solutions for. As with most family members, they are both demanding and rewarding in equal measure. There are a number of external organizations in, in the healthcare sector, as well as universities, pharmaceutical companies, etc., that use the data and we're trying to push more and more data out into the public forum so more people have access to it. So with the challenge of identifying over a billion pound in five years with a number of very demanding public sector bodies requiring high quality and robust data sets, with a shift in organization direction really from just being a high volume transaction processing system, uh, organization to starting to harness that data and use it for the greater good across society. We had to start building a world-class data analytics and insights team. And for those that have done it, you'll know that balance is the key. So bear with me for the next few slides. So just ask yourself, how many members of you two could you name? Um, sadly, we have to name some of them. Probably one of the worst bands that ever, ever lived. But anyway, that's by the by. So it's Bono and the Edge. That's the, nobody reckon, knows the guys at the back. How many members of the Rolling Stones would you recognize if they were walking down the street? And it's the same again, it's the front two, Mick and Keith. And who is your favorite m member of Guns N' Roses? Certainly, certainly wasn't Paul Steve Adler on the drums here. It would have been Axl Rose and Slash. So what's my point really? I've worked in data warehousing and BI pretty much my entire working life so far. And when, and recently when I introduced myself and what my team does, people always respond with, so you're the data scientist, you're the data science team. And I'm always secretly disappointed to be honest, not just because I'll never get paid as well as a data scientist, but it's because those pesky data scientists always seem to steal the limelight. So to explain the difference and the role we all play, I, I always use the same kind of analogy, and it is that essentially the data team, the analytics team is essentially a, the same setup as a band. So just imagine the stage is set and you've got your customers and stakeholders all in situ wondering what's happening with the data, what's happening with their investment. So on lead vocals, you've got the data visualization bots, you've got the analysis statisticians who are building fancy looking visualizations, slick dashboards, statisticians are coming up with interesting facts and snippets on the data, really just screaming, look at this, look at this, look at us. On lead guitar, you've got the data scientists. Now they can play essentially whatever they want, as long as it's within key or to be fair, within reason. Some of what they play is throw away. Some of it is completely experimental but they unearth some absolute gems, some absolute belters, and that is why they're in such high demand, I guess, across, across the globe. And then you've got the spotlights firmly on them, senior management ensuring the spotlight stays on them so that customers and stakeholders keep buying tickets, keep investing in the analytics journey. But that isn't all you need. Now imagine listening to any of those bands I just showed before, let's say Guns N' Roses, and it was just Axl Rose screeching down a microphone and slash noodling on a guitar. It, it just wouldn't work. So you have to have the rhythm section, um, holding it all together and freeing, freeing up those data visualization, those data scientists, those analysts to do what they do best. And these are your data engineers, your infrastructure people, your sport and operations team, they're kind of holding it all together, doing a lot of the dirty work and let, letting the data scientists carry on doing what they do. And at last but not least, at the back of the stage, we've got the data governance, information governance and information security. They, they keep, the, keep the show on the road, keep us all on track and in line. So we started with the rock stars back in 2014. Like I said before, we were asked to identify the recurring savings. We went to market and said, we're going to start doing 
major analytics, what, what, what's the best kit we can buy, what do we need, and the answer was Oracle Exadata. So we went with the Oracle Exadata, because we had a lot of Oracle experience within the NHS BSA already. Um, at that moment in time, it probably still is the, the best hardware you can buy for this kind of analytics. Um, it was secure, it was, it, was, it was scalable, it integrated with R, and we had lots of support with Oracle helping us get set up. We set up a new team of data scientists and statisticians known as the DAL, which is a data analytics learning lab. And like I said, within the first six months, they identified 100 million pounds worth of savings. That got everyone's attentions and really opened the floodgates. So then in 2016, we started to add the rhythm section. And so we started building our enterprise data warehouse and business intelligence systems. Uh, we invested more in Oracle Exadata as a result of the performance, what the DAO were getting. Um, and we went for the full Oracle stack. So we have um, Oracle Analytic Cloud as a BI tool. And the reason we added the rhythm section was to really start to productionize some of the data science initiatives. Um, and start pushing that out to the wider NHS to make more sense of our transactional data. Like I said at the beginning of the presentation, there's, there's a, a number of um, transaction systems that we, we are now harnessing to, to create management information. We wanted to revolutionize internal management information to improve our NHS BSA products and services. So we now have internal services that are, I would say, completely data driven. We're putting data at the heart of every decision they're making. And we want to create one version of the truth to feed all data consumers, um, whether that's internal analysts, statisticians, the wider NHS, um, and also sharing that data and enabling other organizations to contribute. So this is what we ended up with. Um, this is our, our team. So uh, we, we've got data scientists, got data engineers, statisticians, BI developers, analysts, user researchers, making sure that what we are building and pushing out to our customers is on point. We have a training team that go out and train our users on our BI products. We have the support team. We have a data governance team, which allows us to um, raise data quality issues throughout the business and is improving data quality and data literacy throughout the business. And with, with those roles come, come, come the skills you can see on the screen. You know, we obviously have data warehousing and dashboard skills because that's that's the bread and butter but we're, we're pushing ourselves into machine learning predictive and fraud analytics um, like I said one of the big biggest changes in recent years is, is bringing user researchers in and really trying to engage with our customers so the balance in technology has really been powered by Oracle we bring data sources in from both internal and external on-premise or cloud systems, as well as bringing open source data that is published on the internet. And we bring that into our Oracle cloud landscape, which is currently a mix of OCI and OCI Classic, which is Oracle cloud infrastructure. And we make that data available to the wider NHS and public via a, a number of different methods. So we have our um, Oracle analytical cloud BI products, so that's our BI solution. And we have products such as EPAC2, which is our prescribing and dispensing data, EDEN, which is our dental activity data, and EOPS, which is our um, ophthalmic offering. And we also have a public facing um, instance where anybody can log on and start looking at some of the dashboards. And that's, that's called Catalyst. We also send data out using um, the reports from our data science team. We have started to publish more and more data sets on our new open data portal. So you can go on there now and start downloading our prescribing data. We're publishing national statistics and the, the data that makes up those statistics is now on there. So again, we're trying to be more transparent, more open and allow more people to kind of access the data and help out. And then we're also publishing data on our website as well. So when we started out on the data warehouse journey, we had a decision point on whether to use an off-the-shelf ETL product like ODI or Informatica, or whether we spend our time building our own. And we decided to spend our time developing our, 
our own ELT engine that would be engineered for our needs to get the best out of the Oracle technology that we were working with. Um, so we basically built a, a powerful ETL engine using PL SQL and it's completely metadata driven. And I'll just quickly talk to you how it hangs together. So we bring all the, our raw data in, into a landing area and um, we load that into a, a layer that we call SCD2, which uh, because it follows the same principles as a slowly changing dimension type two. So we have no footprint on the, on, on the raw data here. All we do is version control it. And the reason we do that is it gives us full audit, auditability of the changes between the source system every time we get a cut of data. And it also allows us to rebuild data from a specific moment in time. So we can, we can always cover, go back in time and say how we, how, we do, how we got that number. We have a staging layer where we do the transformation and we load that into the final destinations, which are our dimensions and fact tables for anybody that is a, a data warehouse bod you'll understand some of this terminology and then, and then we've got some post processing and just to give a indication of performance so every month when we load our prescription data it's it's we're loading about 90 million items worth that's been dispensed that month um, so when we're loading that data in that's about 1.5 billion database transactions in 45 minutes then in the staging layer, when we add in, add in some of the business logic, it takes 1.5 billion transactions in about 90 minutes. And then we load that data in, into the final destination. It's about 80 million transactions in 12 minutes. So um, it's really, really impressive stuff. And the reason this is work, the setup works so well, um, and it's not just from a data warehouse point of view, it's that the SCD2 layer where we version control the raw data has become the beginnings of our data lake given how complex our data sets are and the number of legacy systems that have to be joined together we found that a mix of our scd2 layer and the transformed dimension of facts the final the final numbers have reduced the time it takes for the data scientists and analysts statisticians and bi developers to uncover new insights it's reduced the replication of data sets across the organization. It's increased accuracy and reduced the number of errors published. And it is increasing data awareness across the business, in particular in terms of data quality and data governance. So sitting on top of the warehouse, we have uh, Oracle Analytics Cloud. Like, like I said, that's our BI, BI platform. Um, we expose our, our data warehouse through the BI tool and we present that data through dashboards and self-serve analytics. We're putting alerts on those dashboards so people aren't having to log in all the time to, to check every month. If they have a problem, it, we, we can knock on their door. We're starting to, to look at what, which, which of our customer base, which of our users will get the most out of the data visualization tool available in OAC we're starting to to investigate and play a bit more with the machine learning aspects of of oac and also which of our customers would benefit from some of the plain text searching so for example if somebody was in a meeting and they needed to know how much was spent on paracetamol in the last six months they could just ask their phone that exact question and it would bring back bring back the data from the warehouse and currently we've got about 4,000 registered users on our, on our BI tools. We're supporting about eight to five internal analysts. There's about over 280 people logging in a day, which is resulting in about 8,000 database queries a day. And the average runtime of those is, is about 14 seconds. So again, it's, it's, uh, it's really impressive stuff. So we've got the data, we've got the tech, and we've got the people. And then we really we have key drivers, key value drivers for everything we do in the um, in the data analytics space. On almost everything we do will fall under one or more of these categories. And I'll quickly talk through some examples. So fraud, error, and waste in the NHS. So it's estimated that over a billion pounds a year is lost to fraud, and um, we we know and probably most people know on the call that data and analytics can can help tackle this 
So just before I start, I've, 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 I've tried to simplify, oversimplify some of these examples. So if you are a pharmacist or a, or you, or, or a clinician, please don't be hounding me on LinkedIn tell him I don't know what I'm talking about. So basically drug, drugs can be prescribed by a GP and they can prescribe a generic drug or a branded drug. drug. For example, paracetamol would be the generic and Panadol is, is the branded version of paracetamol. And really the guidelines GP should be prescribing generic, generically. On the left, you can see you've got 10 drugs, 10 20 milligram tablets of drug Y. So that's a generic prescription. And that will probably, let's say that costs the NHS 51 pence per tablet to reimburse, okay? So on the right hand side, we have the same 10, 20 milligram tablets of drug Y, but the, the GP this time has, has specified the manufacturer of the drug. Now, that doesn't look like a, a big deal at all, but when it comes to a reimbursement cost, it, the difference can be massive. And when you're looking at, you know, millions of prescriptions every, every month, the, the, these pounds and pennies start, start seriously adding up. So as a, a national effort to, to reduce this, the NHSBSA built a dashboard to inform decision makers of, of the real problem areas. And in, in this example, you can see in February 2020, there was 366,000 pounds worth of potential savings of this type of prescribing. You know, this is it's massive amounts of money. Um, so the national effort began in January 19, where potential savings were at an all-time high of one million pounds in one month. And by February 2020, the potential savings was down 366 to 366,000 pounds in a month. The difference just in between those two figures is the equivalent of about 15 A&E nurses. And there was changes to the GP transaction system, the prescribing system. A lot of work went into this um, and overall the dashboards kind of helped lead to about £400,000 worth of savings to be put back into the NHS, which is, you know, really, really impressive stuff. So, some other examples of analytics to find fraud, error and waste have been um, the bending of rules within dental activity. So people splitting courses of treatment, people potentially um, giving out things like mouth guards when they weren't really needed. We, we found activity declared for deceased patients or unknown patients. And we've been using network analysis to look at contractors and suppliers who essentially have the same director in charge of both companies that are doing, doing business together, which may not be um, kind of plain fair, if we, if we can put it that way. And then we've here we've got using our data to improve prescribing behavior. So the overuse of antibiotics has been a topic that has captured the headlines over recent years and months, probably worldwide. And um, during the prescription processing at the NHS BSA, we essentially scan all the, all, all the paper prescriptions. We receive all the electronic ones and we scrape all the data off. So we're collecting the NHS number, the patient age, the date of birth, and that supplements really what, where, and who prescribed and dispensed what drugs, in this case, antibiotics. And this has allowed the NHS BSA to develop an insight and intelligence on antibiotic prescribing to help in that resistance battle. So we've looked at how antibiotic prescribing varies over various patient populations. So there was previously a bit of a gap in understanding relation in relating to prescribing in children. So children tend to get infections, such as the common cold, tonsillitis, flu, more often than adults. Um, anybody who's got young children that go to nursery will know it's a hotbed for, for these kind of illnesses. Um, and the, the majority of these are caused by viruses, uh, and in which case antibiotics will not be effective but prescriptions are still routinely made and this is contributing to the, to the problem of antibiotic resistance. So we've been able to look at prescribing patterns in children 
and variations by GP practice and by groups of GP practices to really start trying to change behavior and highlight behavior. We've also been looking at the prescribing of broad spectrum antibiotics. So although these are effective against a, a wide range of infections, they should typically not be used for non-life threatening conditions. And the overuse of these antibiotics can increase the risk of infections to things such as MRSA. And again, our analysis has been used to support organizations and prescribers in reviewing the appropriateness of their current prescribing habits. We've also been looking at the prescriber types. So a lot of the work we've undertaken so far has been to do with um, antib antibiotic prescribing by GPs, by our doctors, whereas um, the prescribing by dentists hadn't really been looked at in, a, in a great detail. So when looking at dentists, we kind of, we, we found evidence of antibiotic items being prescribed in higher than the recommended doses. You can see on the right hand side there, there's a average daily quantity and um, there's some serious outliers. Um, and when we looked into those, we found a number of reasons, some of them down to something as straightforward as the handwritten prescription being, well, people joke about how bad doctor's handwriting is. Apparently dentist handwriting is even worse. Um, and, and they're being mis misinterpreted by the, by the pharmacists and either the wrong quantity or are being dispensed. So it raises potential waste concerns, but more importantly, safety concerns as well. So, you know, the data scientists did the initial grunt work. They came up with the insights and then we productionized that through our data warehouse and, and BI dashboards. I start pushing that data out to the wider NHS. To, to start improving behaviors, as well as putting that data in the hands of policymakers to make more informed decisions. And compared to two years ago when the dashboard was implemented, we've seen over a million fewer antibiotics prescribed, 107,000 fewer patients having received antibiotics. And in the dental world, in a similar dashboard that's been created, we've also seen reductions in the antibiotic prescribing. So polypharmacy is, is another example, um, and that's a, polypharmacy is a concurrent use of multiple medication items taken by one individual. And certain medications should not really be taken concurrently if you can help it. As you can see there in the orange box, a person taking 10 or more medicines is 300% more likely to be admitted to hospital than those that aren't. And by reducing the number of concurrent drugs, you increase, increasing the chance of lifting some of the burden off secondary care such as hospitals as as well it's more it's a lot cheaper to prevent than to treat um, which is what polypharmacy is all about so using the prescribing data we started to identify patients that were on multiple medi medicines as well as those on potentially harmful combinations so the visualization there shows the number of patients on potential harmful combinations of drugs what those combinations are and where the biggest numbers are so so the places you need to look first which are i.e the red boxes and working with clinicians and combining that with our knowledge of the data we developed the specification productionized that through a dashboard through our bi product called epac2 and the dashboard allows care providers to request the patient details that make up the numbers that they're looking at so they can start to bring those patients in potentially for a medicine review and all being well improve a patient's life or make, ensure that they are on the right care path so for example a user logs in and starts looking at the metrics that are important to them this is an example of the dashboard again it's 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 not all singing and all dancing because some of these things don't need to be um, the example we can see here is the percentage of patients within your area that have been prescribed a specific drug that is likely to cause kidney damage and you can filter on age bands so for example if you're having a big drive to, to look at people that are aged over 85 and over then it's a click of a button and you'll get those stats um, you can compare your performance to the rest of the areas in this in this example it's uh, ccgs within the nhs so the one I'm looking at here is probably in what the top 
top 20 percent and it's under the national average but they still have two percent of their patients that are on these medicines that could cause kidney damage so even though it's below the average you still might want might want to see who those people are so you can request those the the nhs numbers and the detailed patient details that make up that two percent from the nhs bsa and that's really starting to drive behavior so polypharmacy is one that we are probably most proud of um in last year towards the end of last year we were awarded a patient safety award with wessex ahsn who have been a real driving force behind this bit of work. Um, we've seen nearly 10,000 fewer patients on 10 or more medicines and over 200 practices have started to request the details, the patient details that sit behind the metrics. And this is just a great example of how we've taken data from a transactional process of reimbursing pharmacists and found a secondary use that is having a positive impact on people's lives. And then we have enhancing our data to gain new insights. So our data science team have taken on asthma, something that I personally have lived with pretty much my entire life. And I'm not alone that there's over 5 million people in the NHS receiving asthma medication and asthma costs the NHS around 1 billion pounds a year. So by realizing awareness through data analytics, we could potentially reduce that billion pounds a year, but more importantly, have a positive impact on people's lives. So what we're doing here is we're joining our prescribing data sets to open environmental data, such as pollen count data, air pollution, climate and weather data, to look at the, whether there are any specific triggers that impact specific, specific patients. Now this analysis has been turned into a prototype app, which um, could be used in asthma reviews between a, a patient and a GP. So for example, every year I have to go to my GP for a yearly asthma review where they make sure I'm taking my inhalers on a regular basis. They embarrass me, making me blow into one of those peak flow machines, which shows that I've got the lung capacity of an 80 year old chain smoker. And just to make sure that uh, I'm keeping on top of things. So, so, so that it could be used as that. And the way it would work is during one of those asthma reviews, you could say to your GP, well, last month, my asthma was really, really bad. And let's say that was July in this instance on, on, on the graph, you could start to see, well, there was low rainfall and like kind of high pollen counts or whatever. So we could start to predict, you could start to create awareness of what triggers your bad asthma as well as then bringing in future looking environmental data like weather forecast data to start predicting when could be a potentially tricky time for my asthma and I, I would start to be more diligent and when when I take my inhaler and things like that. So this is just another example of using simple data sets um, to potentially make a massive difference and also about how, how we at the NHS BSA are broadening our horizons in the data science and analytics space. And there are a number of other benefits, you know, we, we could talk all day probably about, about some, of the, some of the great work we do. Um, here are some examples, for example, over-the-counter medicines, which is you know, highlighting how much is being spent at the NHS uh, prescribing medicines that can just be bought over-the-counter, like Lemsips, for example. Um, but there's two that really stand out and make me immensely proud to be a part of them. One is we, we are using our prescribing data to send to Public Health England, who are using it to look into care pathways around the cancer registry. And that same data is also being shared with an organization called UKTIS, who are looking at the effects of a variety of drugs and the impact that has on, um, on babies during the pregnancy and any kind of fetal abnormalities. You know, it's just, you know, quite humbling to be, to be part of, of such things. So I'm coming to an end. So, so what's my point of the entire presentation? So yes, we have exciting data sets and we do some, some really great stuff. Yes, that's fantastic. But my main point really is this. All the value add, all the headline grabbing analytics is underpinned by great infrastructure and data that is well engineered. So you can call them ETL developers, data engineers, pipeline architects, the name really is irrelevant, but the work they do isn't. 
or in my analogy, don't forget the guys at the back of the stage, because if you get that bit right, it makes anything possible. And the perfect example is the work we've done as part of the response to COVID-19. So as a result of having a strong reputation within the NHS and beyond for analytics and having a well-engineered data set on solid foundations, we've been able to re be able to react at pace to the challenges raised by COVID-19. For example, very quickly being able to reduce, try and reduce the footfall at GPs, identifying patients who would very easily benefit from electronic repeat dispensing so they don't have to keep going into the GPs to pick up a prescription and we're pushing that out to the practices who can contact those those patients and change the way they collect prescriptions identifying potential pressures on pharmacists based on the regular customer base so how many of the pharmacists regular users are over 70 for example who may need their drugs delivering how many patients are being dispensed drugs that require regular blood tests for example and providing a number of reports around the use of urgent dental care centers around the UK, the fluctuation in drug pricing and any potential drug shortages, similar work that was done during the run up to Brexit. And another real proud dad moment is NHS Digital using our prescribing data set to identify, to help identify and create the shielded patient list. Now for those that of you that are unfamiliar with the UK shielded patient list, our friends over at NHS Digital were asked to compile a list of patients who were at high risk of complications from COVID-19. And at the beginning of lockdown were advised in the UK were advised to self-isolate for 12 weeks. So in a nutshell, um, NHS Digital took patient data, hospital data, maternity data, flu data, as well as our prescribing and dispensing data set and used it to create the shielded patient list. Those patients were contacted using a number of method, methods telling them to self-isolate as part of the shielded program. Now, if you love data and you are nosy like me, you can go and see the logic that NHS Digital applied to those data sets. Um, it's, it's honestly really, really fascinating stuff and the link is there or just, just Google it. Um, it's definitely worth a read. But for our data set to be used in such an important piece of work, I don't think there's any bigger compliment really. And it makes all the blood, sweat and tears. And there have been plenty of those over the years, believe me, makes it all, all worth it. Um, so yeah, that's a bit, that's what we do at the NHS BSA. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you, Andy. Uh, that was a fascinating, uh, presentation. Um, now we have a couple of minutes for questions so if you haven't already uh, please submit them via the Q&A. I can see quite a few there already and just give uh, Andy two seconds to um, open up and have a look. Um, Andy maybe you could pick uh, one or two questions in the last few minutes um, and uh, uh, give us a little bit more insight. Thank you. Hi, yes, yeah, so I'm just having a, a look at some of these. Um, there's one here that is what governance processes are in place to deal with sensitive data, which is, um, you know, obviously a really important question. So the kind of data governance process that we go through is very rigorous before we even start to um, bring data data sets into our environment. We, we, we have our information governance and security, look at the design, review the fields that we're going to use. We only bring the fields in that we, we need to use. We have um, security within the database to, to ensure that only the relevant people can see, see that relative the relevant data so not everyone has access to everything and then we're also um, creating row-based and column-based security to mask some of the um, sensitive data so it's something we take very very um, very seriously and um, it's constantly on our mind and we're always look, we're always improving improving that um, there's one there's one here 
that says, Andy, is the antibiotic resistance and polypharmacy dashboard available for doctors to access? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, so if you were to Google um, NHS BSA EPAC2, you can go on the website there and, and request access. And it's just a, a form you fill in and, and, and you go through the process like that. So definitely get on board and, and um, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but I will. Um, there are plans afoot to, to look at what which of our dashboards can are of use to GPs and whether we, we, we build a GP offering to allow you to have access to that data. Um, there's one here that says, how do, how do you find and retain di data scientists? And it's difficult, and it's difficult to find any data data bods. Um, I think the market's kind of everyone's after data scientists. So we have career pathways, so you can so you can come in as a junior data scientist and, and train up. You can come in as a statistician and and kind of work your way through the BSA and become a data scientist. You could start out as a data scientist and move into data warehousing if, if it wasn't for you. We've got a number of, of, of ways of, of bringing them in. The way we retain them really is essentially through the work. Like, like you said there, um, there's always something new, um, especially in primary care, uh, prescribing, dental and ophthalmics. You know, the landscape's changing all the time. Um, so we're really pushing ourselves in there. And then we're about to start looking at workforce data as well, how we can start retaining workforce across the NHS. So again, for, for a data scientist, that, 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 that's absolute gold. I'm just conscious of the time, so keep me right, Duncan. Okay, um, I think we've got um, time just for uh, one more. I'm just having a quick look through the, the questions myself. Um, Got opportunity for one more, and then we will call it a day. Okay. Um, there's there's one about um, our journey from on-premise to, to cloud. So, so yeah, we um, back in 2014 we, we were on completely on-premise. We, we we started on-premise. Uh, and then we've moved to cloud. We've done a number of migrations over the, the last five years um, to get to where we want to be. We are definitely looking at um, moving to the second generation of, of cloud infrastructure, but it's been relatively smooth, you know? I mean, these migrations are never just click a button, but, um, you know, to, to move from on-premise to cloud, and then to move to, from cloud BIX to, to OIC from a business intelligence point of view, it's been relatively straightforward. Uh, Oracle have been obviously great in supporting us. So um, yeah, the, you know, we're a cloud first organization, so that's where we want to be. And I think okay. I've talked for too long. Yep, I've, we've come up for 45 minutes. So um, thank you again, Andy, for your time today that was as I said before a fascinating presentation um, just so that everyone who is aware this recording will be on the OA Summit hub www.oracle.com slash OA Summit if you want to go back and watch for a second time um, please don't forget to join us for the other sessions that we have planned in the Oracle Analytics series um, so again um, as I said uh, do check out the sub the, the hub at oracle.com slash OA Summit. And uh, thank you again for attending and stay safe. Have a good day. Cheers.